Right, okay. Thanks, Miles. That's a lovely introduction. Um, so yeah, tonight I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, we're going to do some different things. We're going to think about what's going on in, in the current uh, technology space, and what, we're going to look a little bit about what might be happening in the future. And the idea of this, uh, this talk really was about how do we get ourselves ready today for what's coming up in front of us? Let's see which button to press. There we go. So today's web is very, very unpredictable. It's, it's moving much faster than it was before. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is what's likely to change in the future. Of course, a little bit of guesswork going on. Um, but whichever way it goes, how we can do some things now to prepare ourselves for the future. So when we got started in this business, so as Miles said, we've been working together even longer than 15 years, I think. Um, when we were working in the content management space before it was called content management, we pretty much knew what we were dealing with. We were dealing with a desktop. We were dealing with multiple browsers that didn't talk to each other and didn't behave the same way. And that we knew the set of problems we were dealing with. And over the last 15 years, we've been introduced to these new, uh, new spaces, whether it be micro laptops, iPads, tablets, phones. And we've got to the place with mobile web. So we're, at the moment, we refer to these. We know about these devices. We, we've got used to it now. We know what we're dealing with. And we refer to these now as the, as the known consumer before we start thinking about the unknown. So by definition, the known consumer to me is anything that we're testing for. But there's a whole realm of other things that are unknown to us. And where that's coming from is what's being referred to as the Internet of Things. So we've got this whole new range of Internet-enabled devices. Um, in, the, in the media, often that's referred to as your, your sort of the headline kind of devices that people are talking about, your Internet-connected fridge that knows what's in there and knows how to order your, uh, do your order at Sainsbury's and that sort of thing. Maybe it's domestic appliances, uh, your, your Nest, your, you know, these sorts of devices are all uh, now connecting themselves to the internet. But we've also got a whole load of other things that are not necessarily talked about quite so much, don't, don't really feature in the CES highlights. And this is an example of an ad that was just a couple of years back now, but this is really a pioneering ad. Not far from here, as you can probably see. This is a British Airways ad, award-winning ad. And what was happening here is the system was able to pick up on the beacons of the planes going over. And that was fed into an application which could identify the flights. And when, when, the, when the flight was you know, one of the trigger flights, it would activate this billboard and then bring up the information for the flight. So this is a great innovative, innovative advert that was going on. And this is exactly the sort of thing we're talking about now. This, is now, this was pioneering, but now this isn't actually that uncommon. We're now in a place where advertising, billboards, and so on, are internet-connected devices consuming content. And then if we look at a few other types of devices, we've got environmental monitoring, we've got infrastructure, all these sort of you know, heavy industry things, again, all connected to the internet, which is one of the big risks in our, in our world today, that these things are all connected. So energy management, medical healthcare, that sort of thing. And then further away than that, We've got the consumer level devices. We've got the wearable devices, the watches, the Fitbits, these sort of thing. And what we're referring to is the quantified self, this desire that we have to collect data and collect statistics about ourselves for what purposes, uh, who knows. But we, you know, we, we're looking a lot at Strava at the moment, for example, for developing the data collection exercises. And then we've got smart retail, the advent of beacons and things that are already in place in shops that we don't even know are there, uh, tracking us, making sure that what we're looking at, understanding what we're looking at and presenting us content uh, that's relevant. Okay, so there's something like, I can't remember the stat, it's like 55 million devices connected every day to the internet worldwide. So how many of these are actually content consuming devices that we really care about? We can take a big chunk of these devices away and not worry about those. Um, but there is a whole load left that are content consumers in a different category than we, than we saw before. So these are some examples um, 
we know that very recently Vodafone switched from a system where their in-store kiosks uh, used to be driven by DVD or CD. So whenever there was an update to their content, someone had to go around every kiosk in every store in Europe, plug the CD in, load the new content up. But now uh, they have a central content repository, so a content management system with no front end that is capable of feeding this new content out to all the stores simultaneously via a, what we call a content factory or a content hub. So we've gone from this place where actually the content we're creating in our CMS isn't necessarily for the web. It could be for a completely different context, even though that's a website I'm showing. Um, the consoles in the store have a slightly different feel, but they're consuming the same content. And then, of course, we have this one, which is the one that's really going to change things this year. So we had voice user interfaces before. We had Siri, uh, and we've had these things for a couple of years now, but they weren't really that penetrable. So Siri, for example, was very proprietary to Apple, very difficult to get into uh, if you wanted to make new. Uh, in fact, for a long time, you couldn't do anything with it, only what Apple wanted. But with the Amazon Echo that's been released, it's a very different model. It's very, very open, and it's very, very easy to create new uh, Echo skills. So you can uh, program one of these devices to listen for certain commands and to interpret and send back information. One of the pioneering apps here was sits on there yet. It's the Jamie Oliver app, which you can literally ask the Echo device uh, for a chicken recipe or something like that. And so it's not quite at the level of knowing what's in your fridge, but it can ask you a few prompting questions, take you through a decision process. The end result of this, again, this is a new device, and I don't think we've quite got there yet with how these can be used, because the end result of that particular application is it will email you the recipe. So it's a little bit disjointed still, but we're getting there. We're getting there, and like EDF Energy down in Brighton um, have done a great job where you can just talk to the Echo and give it your meter readings. Now, that's a useful application that means I don't have to go on a website and you know fill in loads of stuff that I don't want to do. So we're seeing this. We, we really think that 2017 is going to be the time where everything changes again, because voice UI is, rather than something that's on the horizon, it's now very, very much with us. So what we're finding is that it's, this is the time where people need to figure out how these things work. It was very much the same with, with the Apple Watch and the wearable watches, that sort of thing, and it still is. People haven't quite got there yet with what these things are for, and that's, that's exactly where we are right now. So I want to take you through some crystal ball gazing, future gazing, sky gazing, whatever you want to call it. And some of these things that I've been thinking about that might happen, who knows, but they're very, very possible with the technology that we have today. So this is an example. Um, the FIFA football game came out last year, and immediately there was a load of people complaining that the ratings of the players didn't work very well. So, you know, in the old days, we had a situation where you had your DVD, you press your DVD, that was it, that was the game. Maybe you had some updates over the air, but that was pretty much it. But now, we're ex people are expecting more. Um, you're very much in a place where you should be able to fix these problems. So I thought, what about this? Obviously, as Mars mentioned, we might have been working in the football space at the moment, so it gave me this inspiration. What about if we could talk to EA Sports and we could talk to Arsenal. And Arsenal could provide the data in a way that EA Sports could consume it through a PlayStation or, or something else. What about if we were in a place where my player, a favorite player, whatever, was injured on a Saturday and then I picked up the game on a Saturday night and I couldn't play that player anymore because of that injury? What about if we could get that close? These games are getting more and more complex and more and more real. And I think that this is a great example of where content we can be consumed in a way that we haven't really thought about. But it's still content management. So all it is, is is exposing that content in a way that that game can understand. And this is another one. This is a screenshot of the FDA website, so the Food and Drug Administration in the US. We have the equivalent in the UK. And one of the biggest things on this is uh, the Food and Drug Administration is responsible for recalling medical devices if they're faulty or dangerous or whatever. But the only way to do it at the moment is to fill in all the data about the product, to 
to find out whether it's on a list of recalls. So what if we could expose this data in a different way? Because at the moment, the person who's going to check that form is not necessarily a paramedic who might be out in the field. It's going to be someone in procurement somewhere. But what if we develop these devices so that, and we develop the content so that the device can check for itself? And what if, the most, probably the most extreme case, what if that device checks itself, realizes it's now unsafe to use, and deactivates itself? Loads of ethics and various other conversations to have before that can happen. But, you know, theoretically, these things are now where we are. And then, not that far ahead of us, is this new concept of the autonomous vehicle. We're not that far away from Uber deciding they don't need those drivers anymore. And we're in a place where we're sort of assuming at the moment that, OK, so I don't have to drive and I don't have to look where I'm going. What am I going to do? OK, I could, if I thought about it in today's world, I'd think I've got a phone, I've got a tablet, and that's probably what I'm going to do. But the reality is it's a completely different thing that we haven't even experienced yet. And it might be that content is coming out of small directions, whether it be this is a from Mercedes concept. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's, there's content coming in from all directions there. And this is you know, self driving cars, autonomous cars are going to change a lot of things. This is one, but it obviously could change the nature of the economy itself. So, that's some of the future gazing stuff. But how this stuff works and how we present this data is, is the key to this. Because we know that software is not very good at understanding meaning in content. And if you take a real uh, example here of a route plan, if you fed a route plan into one of these autonomous cars that's not quite ready yet, it doesn't know what to do with this stuff. It doesn't know how to read this route data. It could probably have a good go, but it's not designed for that. It's designed for human consumption, not for a system to consume. And this is what we call unstructured data. So it looks quite nice but it's not structured in a way that a machine can understand it. So in this case, you know, we would expect the car to be able to read the route data in a certain different format. And this is another example of, again, content, lovely layout of content. It's a recipe from BBC Good Food. Um, how do I get that data into my diet app over here? How do I know that all of this stuff that I'm creating here, and it's got everything there. You can see it's there. But how do I get that over to that diet app? So we need to be able to present this complex data, which is very much laid out for human consumption, into a place where other things that we don't know about could potentially make use of it and, and make use of this different types of data. So what do we do? How do we support these unknown consumers? We, we need to move to a place where with all these theoretical things that could be happening in the future, how do we support them now? And to do that, we need to take a step back and we need to think about how we do things today. And today, we're still very much thinking in the content, uh, in the content model of a page. We think we're going to make a web page. We're going to make an article as a page. And we've come a long way, actually, in, the, in our, lifespan, our lifespan of the web. We now have this semantic web, which allows us a little bit of uh, interpretation where the header is, where the nav is, where the section is, and so on and so on. But really, that's, that's helping, but it's not enough. So semantic web was the first step in the right direction. And what we need to do is we need to use content management systems of types that allow us to move beyond the page, and allow us to not think in that paradigm anymore. So what we're looking for is something that allows content modeling and structuring of content in ways that we can protect ourselves from these things that are to come. And we also need a way to deliver and access that content in a, in a regularly skewed way. But in order to get there, we have quite a few challenges to get past. The first one really is, is the content creation. Um, often what we've seen is that content creation and design are very closely aligned. Um, we need to be able to relinquish the control of that layout and change the way we go about making content. And I've got some examples of this. There's a few really well-trodden arguments that have been going on over maybe the last five or six years 
Um, so I'm not going to go into them too much, only to say, if you're really interested in this stuff, this is, this is the stuff to Google to find out about the backstory. So the first argument is the, the blobs versus chunks argument, um, sometimes referred to as the battle of the body field. And that was bas basically what it meant was that traditional CMS content management systems, you would have a title, and you would have a WYSIWYG editor, and you could control the layout, and you could do quite a lot of stuff within that field. But the trouble is with that, there's no structure. You, know, you are still thinking about building a page in that scenario. So that, that argument is still, still ongoing from time to time. Um, but we're, what we're trying to do is get away from that concept that you need this WYSIWYG. You don't need a WYSIWYG if you're doing structured content in this way. The second argument that we see a lot is the adaptive, adaptive design versus responsive design, which for a long time I didn't know there was much of a difference. But what it really means is adaptive design is about the, the whole philosoph philosophical argument about whether every single device that requests content from you gets the same thing, and whether that device then makes its own decisions about what to do with what it receives. There is one side of the argument that says you should send what the device needs. So if it's an Amazon Echo, it doesn't need a 10-page publication. It needs you know, a two-line abstract or, or whatever it might be. And whilst that argument, I say, is well, well trodden, it was very much accepted that we should send all the content to every device and let the device decide for itself rather than being opinionated. What we're seeing now is that we've got a whole new realm of devices where that argument needs to be challenged again. So really, the, the next thing to think about, assuming we do all these things, why do we want to do these things? Uh, what, what's the purpose of, of you know, preparing for this thing that, again, is very much theoretical? Um, so there are a few business models that we've been considering. You've got this open data business model, uh, which speaking to people before this talk, I, I know is certainly uh, available in this room. So having the open data, which means basically exposing everything to everyone and relying on other models to, to generate revenue. There's, once you go to an API model, you've got these options to say, OK, you can only get the data in this form with a token, with a subscription, or potentially even metered so that you can only get X number of articles per month, which I know is a, is a model also that's well used in publishing. But on top of that, we can offer value add. We can, we can give more rather than just metering and charging people content. We can structure our content in ways like the example with the, the Arsenal and the EA Sports, where that's actually something genuinely valuable that we could be offering on top that we weren't offering before. So we're offering our content in a usable format. And I think very much what we're seeing at the moment is that with the Echo and everything else, is there's a bit of a race at the moment, and everyone's trying to figure out what's the right thing to do here. And I wonder whether naked content, if you want to call it that, content away from the design could be an alternative in, in, this, in this age where we're being under pressure from ad blockers and these sort of you know, things that are preventing the traditional revenue streams from working. Right. So how do we get there? From here, using the technology we have today. So this is where we get a bit more practical. Um, I don't know what systems you're all using, but you never know. There might be some stuff in here that, that is relevant to, to you. So the first thing we need to do is look at the content model. And, and when, we, when we go into new projects, one of the first workshops we do is determining the content model of the system. Before you even figure out the technology you're going to use, it's very much about determining how this, the taxonomy and the content is actually going to work. And then we want to get to a place where we've got an API so we can expose the content to these unknown consumers that we don't know. If we can publish the API that tells these devices, this is how you get to my content, then we're in a place where we don't need to know all these different use cases, because they'll happen on their own if we provide that data. I want to give you an example of a content model just to help you through sort of understanding what I'm talking about. And they generally start quite easy and straightforward, like this one. You start off, you've got an article, and that's got a headline, it's got a body, and it's got an image. That's it, nothing else. Maybe a bit of taxonomy, some meta tags, that sort of stuff. But then we started working through, and again, we always try and get as many stakeholders in the room as possible, and we sort of end up with this. So this is an example, not a real one, it's a theoretical example from a theoretical football client, okay? 
So we've got the article, but the article can be related to maybe a fixture, and that fixture is on a calendar. And there might be previous fixtures where we played that team before. We need the results. We might need the audio commentary. Um, what competition is it from? They have a ladies' team, a men's team, the youth team. Where are they in the table? Um, you know, who are the players? Do, do the players have their own stats? Uh, what's the venue we're playing at today? And that sort of thing. So you can suddenly realize that just by thinking through the relationships of all these different types of content, you end up with this big web of stuff, all of which is valuable on its own. And doesn't, you know, if you go down the traditional model of building a page and just throwing all that together, if I build a mobile app that says, just give me the results, then I can't easily get to that data. So this, the whole point of this is structuring that data in a way that we can get to it really, really easily and use it in, again, and, you know, the whole point is we let other people consume this content and come up with really innovative ideas that we didn't necessarily come up with. And this is where it gets a bit sciencey. I don't know. Or maybe I'll get this a bit quick. Who knows? Um, so what we try to think about is some tips on how to do this stuff when you're creating content models in a content management system. Object-oriented programming is something that's been around for many, many years. And there are a few principles to it that I think map directly to, to content modeling. So what we have is we have content objects, which have their data in the form of fields. Those are the definitions that we use. Um, and then what we're trying to get to is things that there's one thing in object-oriented program is that you each piece of code does one thing, and that's, that's the only thing it does. There's no confusion. And that's what we're trying to get to with, with content. So a content type should be really, really simple, simple as it can be. It should only do one thing. There should be no confusion. And it shouldn't assume about any other dependencies it might have. And every, within that content type, every single field should also have one clear purpose so that we know without ambiguity what it's there for. Of course, this doesn't always happen. Is that going to play? Who knows? It doesn't really matter. It's just a ship. The ship falls in the water if it plays. It doesn't matter. <laughs> there we go. Um, so what I want to do now is to talk you through some of the things we see all the time, in, either in projects that we're taking on or, or when we're going through workshops. These are the things to look out for. Yeah, that's it. OK. So I've got, I've got four different examples of things to look out for. And I, won't, I won't ask you whether you've seen these before. So number, number one is what I call non-content content. It's the one that drives me crazy. Um, and this means the content type that does nothing on its own. And sometimes you'll hear them called signposts, or jumps, or shortcuts, or anything else. And all they are is little bits in the content management system that don't really represent anything apart from a link to somewhere else. And it's, a, it's something that ends up in, regardless of the technology, it's sometimes a pattern that ends up happening. But instead of that, what we try to encourage is content with different views. So taking this mode that we talked about just now, having content with loads of different fields, that means you can present that content in different ways, but it's the same thing. So this is an, an example here of a te what we would call a teaser. And then the full article is exactly the same piece of content, just displaying in a completely different form and with different information. In the teaser, I don't need to know the author. Um, I don't need the social shares and stuff like that. But when I get to the full article, I need all of that stuff. This is an example there. So th this is how to get around that. Yeah, instead of showing these shortcuts, we should show a teaser view of the actual article we're going to. This is the next one that we see a lot. And it's often the case when a system has been around for a few years. Um, what we see here is the, co the, the Godzilla content type is when you have a gigantic content type that does loads and loads of things. Um, people have added fields to it over the years. Um, and it normally, is, it normally comes about when, when we do that content modeling. And people are a bit reluctant to have multiple content types. They want to try and simplify things. And they end up simplifying it by making one huge one with hundreds of fields in. Uh, and we get to a place where. You know, you've got multiple use cases. You don't really know. Um, you, know, you don't want to have these multiple content types. 
And instead of that, we want to try and encourage people to have smaller content types. And it's OK if you have loads of content types. Because when you do that, when I go in and I say, what am I, what am I here to do? I'm here to create a new player, or I'm here to create a new story. You know, I, I can control the thing I'm doing in a quite a close way. So we have to think about how these content types relate to each other. And again, making sure that they have single responsibility and you're not trying to use one thing to do to multiple things on the website. This one, I guess, is quite obvious, really. But again, what we see here, uh, field ambiguity, we see a field name that doesn't quite make sense to the author. So we get uh, to the editor, sorry. So someone is using the, the form, trying to create their content, and they can't quite remember what that meant. Never a good sign. Uh, and we, of, we often find that when, in, in this layout, this field does this. In this layout, it does this thing over here. And that leads us to a loss of structure that which is, is not so good. So instead of that, we're trying to agree clear, name, clear naming right up front in those content workshops. And obviously, lots of help text to help us through it. And the last one I've got is the, the using content for logic. This is another classic that we see quite a lot. Uh, and this means adding fields to your content type that aren't really fields at all. And what they're really there for is to change the layout of the page, which, again, if you think about where we've come from, the things we've been talking about here, those fields make no sense. Because a field that says background color blue doesn't make sense to that autonomous car. So we've got, we've got content in there that should be somewhere else. The layout shouldn't be influencing, influenced by the content. The application theme layer of your content management system should be doing that work for you. Right, so I'm just keeping an eye on my time. Um, so what next? So how do we do this stuff? So what we're recommending, um, and obviously as, as, as is our business, we're looking for a CMS that a good content model tool set is your first place to start. You can't do this stuff if the CMS doesn't support it. But we need to make sure that all the stakeholders in the project that we're working on understand why we're doing the things that we're doing. Because if you don't get the concept and why we're doing this stuff, then it's very, very difficult to get the end goal. Right, we want to split the content from the design. And this is going to be tricky, because traditionally, you know, editors, uh, content creators have assumed that they have a certain amount of freedom over, OK, I want to put this image here. I want to put this one on the left. But we're taking that stuff away, because we don't need that in structured data. It doesn't matter whether the image is on the right or the left, because the content is clean of design. And we need to handle those creative objections early and explain why we're trying to do these things, that we're not trying to take away their creative freedom. We're trying to do things in a different way, and they can still get the end result they're looking for. So we need to spend lots of time on that content model, more time than you realize, to certainly think through and get different stakeholders involved to think through how all this content links together and how that's important. And the last one really is future proofing. Um, it's inevitable that we replatform systems every few years or whatever. And ultimately, what that means is we've got to move that content from one place to another. So doing this kind of thing now means that it's easy to move from one place to another later. And, and we've had some, you know, we've had some problems in the past where, it, because it's so difficult to migrate data, decisions will be made like, well, let's just keep two years' worth and drop the rest. And that's horrible to hear, because you know, we're, we're in this world where we're all these, you know, we've changed digital media so often that we've lost so much data in the last 20 years, because we can't even read those formats anymore. If we start making decisions like, we don't need that data, then we've lost a big part of our legacy. So we can't really future-proof our content, so I took that way. But really, what it's about is preparing your content for the future, because we don't really know what the future is. Everything here has been about you know, theoretical stuff, trends that we're seeing in the market at the moment. So we want to prepare for the future, but we want to ensure that portability of content and embracing the unknown, because that's where that innovation is going to come from, and creating a legacy in content. And that's really, really important to me is that legacy of content and not relying on those sort of people at the, the archive projects 
it's up to us to look after this content, look after our history, and make sure that it's there for future generations to come. And I've got question sessions later, but that's it for me for now. Thank you very much. <laughs>